It's exciting when you're doing a series called Towards Belief, looking at the belief blockers that keep people from faith in, in Christ. Or, and, and I believe whatever keeps people from God or perceptions or realities that keep people from an awareness of the love of God, are, it's a tragedy. Anything that would establish itself in our society or in culture that would establish itself as being worthy of standing between God and people is a tragedy. As we learned last week um, in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, through Christ. And it, it, you can imagine when we're having our teaching team meeting and we're, we're looking at all the topics of science and religion, the authority, uh, authenticity of the scriptures, pain and suffering, where's God in the midst of pain and suffering? Um, how can we have a credible Christian witness with the church's traditional teachings on homosexuality? And, um, and it's like, so who wants to preach this one? And it's just crickets for all of them. So generally what we do is we just, we just dob each other in and we're like, Cass, you do that one. You'll do that one awesomely. And she did awesomely last week. And, um, and I got dobbed in for this one, which I'm really excited about on um, sexuality. And thanks, Fiona. I'm really glad that you're excited about that. And, um, and Lockie Donaldson tonight on science and religion. Lockie is one of the greatest minds in our church. And he has a character that is after, uh, he's a man that has a heart after the Lord. Um, but he also has a wonderful mind and he thinks differently about things than anyone else I know. And, um, and so come along. I just want to start with a story. I, I wasn't going to share this story, but I felt prompted to just then. And I'm actually just emotional thinking about it. I was, went out to a movie with my wife last week, a rare movie, the first date night we've had in a long, long time. And we were at um, the the hot chocolate shop at, what's it called, at West Lakes? Sanchuro's, quality health food there. <laughs> and I was eating some quality health food and Nikki is sharing with me about some very important things, um, which I can't remember. And <laughs> she's not here, it's okay. I've, I've got two sick boys, so I've got to leave past to be honest this morning. And, and there's something in the middle of my conversation with Nikki and uh, I could see there's a guy sitting next to us talking to his friend who is a girl and um, I, you know when you overhear something in a conversation then you can't hear anything else that's happening in your conversation and I heard this guy talking about when his parents and the elders in his church um, when he came out to, to the elders in his church, came out of the closet, and he was kind of laughing about it and saying how they kind of freaked out. And, and then he proceeded to talk about the church, and um, there was just so much uh, anger in his voice. And Nikki's trying to engage me, and I'm trying to pretend to listen. And I just had this sudden desire to reach across the table and just hug this guy and tell him I love him God loves him and that there's good news for his life that the gospel is good news for him but then everything in me is thinking me as a Christian pastor right now I'm the epitome of everything this guy doesn't want to hear and I'm there and I'm just like and it was about half an hour into the movie that Nikki was like what's got into you and then I proceeded to um, explain to her. And I didn't share with this guy because I thought it might be rude interrupting in a private conversation, which it probably would have been. But I just felt compelled to pray for this guy. And I think that there's something going on in, in our world where people think or suspect that we as Christians would think ill of them. Anyone from any other religion, any other walk of life. Forbid that anyone would walk into our presence and think anything less than I will receive grace and love and embrace from this community, from this person. And I think that there's, there's a reality problem and there's a perception problem. Um, in the book Unchristian by Dan Kinnaman and 
Gabe Lyons. Gabe Lyons? I think that's it. Um, they wrote a book called Unchristian where they, uh, they looked at, basically they interviewed people that are self-identify as being non-church, non-Christian in the United States. And the perception came out loud and clear that Christians show contempt for gays and lesbians. That was the overwhelming theme. And perception is not everything, but perception is not nothing. Perception is not everything, but perception is not nothing. That the general belief is that Christians show contempt for gays and lesbians. Um, there was also a, a study done of young people. When I say young, it's pretty much my age and younger because I like to self-identify as being young. Um, and I'm 30, so pretty much my generation and younger, so Gen Y, millennials, younger, from that age group, 91% associated the word anti-homosexual with modern-day Christianity. 91%. Perception is not everything, but it's not nothing. There's also, in their research, there was a, an interesting trend that, that apparently, for people, they find it ironic that Christians, our antenna doesn't go up when people admit to gluttony, lying, the use of pornography, getting a divorce but we seem fixated on homosexuality. And one of the only places where Christian voices are heard in the media is when generally a very loud Christian voice is speaking about their opposition to same-sex marriage, and that will end up in the front pages of the newspaper. And the Christian voice on just about any other ethical, moral, or justice issue is marginalised and not even really of interest. And I am committed and I'm passionate about the fact that Jesus has good news for all people. That the gospel is not good if it's not good for all people, if it's not good for the rich and for the poor, for the gay and the straight, for the broken and those people that think that they're whole, but really they're they're not. And I believe that this morning that God wants to fill us as a church with a confidence in the power of the gospel. And in the same way that people's outside of the walls of this church, homosexuality, Their homosexuality is not keeping them from Jesus any more than your heterosexuality is keeping you with Jesus. Jesus loves human beings, complex, beautiful, made in his image. And I want to start by just saying that in this message, what I don't want to do, some things I'm not going to do, I don't want to speak as if people with same-sex attraction are them out there in a community a church this size there are dozens of us not them us that have same-sex attraction some people it might be a level of sexual attraction to the same sex some people it might be more of a sexual orientation that we're almost exclusively attracted to the same sex and for some of us we might be in relationships where we are expressing our same-sex attraction with same-sex sexual relationships That's not them out there, that's us. And I just want to acknowledge that as a pastor, I speak to so many people with broken and complex personal lives. I look at my own broken and far from perfect personal life. We're all complex human beings and we all struggle with weaknesses and temptations, amen? And the call for us all is to follow Christ in the midst of our struggles. And if you think that that call is not radical for all people here, then you're missing the point of the gospel. If you think think that the call for the person that's um, attracted to someone of the same sex, that's a big call to follow Jesus. Let me tell you, if you've been married for 20 years to the same woman or to the same man, there is a call upon your life to make Jesus number one. And it's a radical call. Jesus is the one that called us to lay down our life to follow him, the one that laid down his life for us. So I don't want to think about people outside the church as them. It's us. We are complex. We are broken and we need a healer. I also, in this message, I don't want to judge people outside the church, mainly because the Bible says not to. 1 Corinthians 5.12, Paul says, it's 
you know, we're, that's not what you're called to do, to judge those outside of the church. Because you know what? Last time I checked, they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. And they're not professing to follow Jesus. For those of us that are saying, I want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, we, want to, we need to encourage each other to live holy lives. We need to encourage each other to not pursue things that are going to um, disobey God and going to hurt ourselves and hurt others. Um, but we are not called to judge those outside the church. And on a pendulum, we need to judge a whole lot less. And whenever we feel tempted to point the finger at someone else, in the words of Matthew chapter 7, we need to remove the massive chunk of wood from our own eye right before pointing out the splinter in someone else's. And Jesus was really rock solid on this teaching. This is what Jesus majored on, hypocrisy. And we need to be really careful on it. Um, The other thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to elevate this idea that sexuality is the great moral issue of our day. Do you know what, as Kevin Rudd said famously, that climate change is the greatest moral challenge of our world today? That went well for him. Um, (laughs) The the truth is the greatest moral challenge to the church and the greatest moral challenge to Western civilization is not homosexuality. What a load of rhubarb. The greatest moral issue of our day is self-righteousness and people saying and people refusing to acknowledge their need for Jesus. And that can manifest by people being completely rebellious and independent in their personal life. It can, it can manifest itself by people being religious, fundamentalist hypocrites, convinced that they know best and everyone else is wrong. It can manifest by people saying, being so full of pride that they don't open up to the possibility that God might want to intervene in their life. Self-righteousness saying, I don't need Jesus. I don't need saving. I don't need forgiveness. It's like um, Donald Trump said, I'm a Christian, but I've never asked for forgiveness. I've never met a Christian that's never acknowledged the need. It's kind of like, last time I checked, it's kind of like Christianity 1A. I need forgiveness. (laughs) But I'm not his judge. Jesus is. (laughs) I don't know the condition of his heart. (laughs) I just observe the things that come out of his mouth. The other thing that I'm not going to do is I will not make apologies for the radical call of Jesus in the Gospels. But it's challenging for everyone here to live lives where we deny ourselves and we put him first. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If anyone wants to be my disciple... You need to take up your cross and follow him. And it should not be surprising to anyone. And they say, wow, doesn't Christianity sound really hard? But, uh, the, the radical moral framework of Christianity, isn't that difficult to live out? And that's when we say, yes, it is. But our starting point is the fact that God came to earth and he was tortured for us and he chose it for us and he gave us grace and unconditional love. And he says, I love you just the way you are. And then we get to live for him. And so it doesn't seem so bad if we think about where it all starts. It starts with the finished work of Jesus. It starts with the unconditional, unfathomable, relentless love of God who would do anything for us. But there is a radical call, not to die for the sins of the world, but to take up our cross and follow Him. Be people of the cross. To deny ourselves and to deny anything that would come between us and God. Any idolatry or anything that would come between us and God. You see, Jesus is not just our teacher. He is our example and never let anyone tell you half of this room in this t- today is single and not in a, like a, a marriage relationship. And I want to tell you, never let anyone look down on you because you are single. The most whole, the most complete, the most satisfied, the most secure human being that ever lived with us was the Lord Jesus. When he was picking disciples to change the world, to turn the world upside down, he picked single men except for one. Never let anyone look down on you or say that you are lacking or that you need completing with another human being. Jesus is not just our teacher. He's our example. He is the most whole person that ever lived. And Jesus didn't go around lowering the bar, lowering the bar and saying, do whatever you want. Jesus radically raised the bar for sexual ethics. And he said, you know what? You think you're crystal clean. You think you're pure. You think you haven't done this, this and this. Well, if you've looked at someone with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery in the heart. I stand before you today as an adulterer of the heart. When I look at myself, I don't think, oh God, thank God I'm not like those people. Do you know what? I am one of those people. 
I am one of those people. I am a sinner saved by God's grace and by His grace, I want to live a redeemed life. I want to be changed and God's still working on my heart. He's still working on my eyes. He's still working to conform me to the image of Jesus. I wonder if He's doing that in you. And I wonder if that might give you more grace for some people that are just earlier along the journey. You see in the Bible, in the book of 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, it says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will um, not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither, neither the sexually immoral, the idolatrous, or adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You see, Paul basically lists a whole pile of things that the church, people in the church used to be. What it tells me is the church is a tapestry of all the different sins across society. And then we come to Jesus and then we say, those things no longer define us. We are the people of God and those things no longer define us. And that's what we were, but we have been washed. We have been sanctified. We have been set apart. And the church, as it continues to be the hands and feet in Jesus, we will continue and we must continue to be a people uh, that represent all the different walks of life that meet the amazing grace of Jesus. You see... The problem for me as a pastor is, you know, I find this pretty confronting because most of the conversations I have with people about sensitive issues had to do with idolatry. People putting other things before God. That's a massive issue in our society, isn't it? Pastor, like this is just, and I'm not talking, like this is even in us as Christian leaders, idolatry, greed, sexual immorality. I mean, the number of us in this room that struggle with pornography addictions. And forbid it that in one of those conversations, someone would say to me, Tim, I'm struggling with this and I want to overcome. Will you pray for me? And as if I would, as if I would judge them, as if I would kick them out and say, oh, I can't believe you're telling me that. Get out. No, no, no. The heart of God is to say, thank you so much for bringing that into light. I want to bring healing. I want to help you to claim victory over this by the Holy Spirit. I want to build good patterns into your life. I want to renew your mind. That's what you were. That's not who you are. That's what we think about pornography. That's what we think about greed. That's what we think about idolatry. And that's what we should should think about homosexuality as well. We should be people of grace, people of confidence in the power of the gospel to say there are some things that are in our past and some things that are even in our present that will not define our future. Our identity is be people of the Spirit. Jesus raises the standards and he says, ultimately, no one can reach this bar. And so when you realize the sexual ethics of Jesus, you realize all of us need to bow our knee and say, God, I need you. God, I'm sorry. I just want to make four observations just before I get my preach on. I haven't started preaching yet. Four observations are these. First of all, the issue of same-sex relationships is not an issue. It's about people, people that want to be loved and want to love others. I remember when I was, I first started working at my first job out of Christian school, I was this naive little Christian school boy and I met this guy who identified as a gay man and, and, and I said, oh, so can you tell me, so did you have a really bad relationship with your father? Because I thought that's what, you know, that's what I was told. I, I was actually, I, I, reflecting back, I, I was very homophobic as a teenager and I'm, I, I've had to really repent of that. Um, I was in a Christian school where jokes and all sorts of disgusting things were said, and I, I really am sorry for that. And I met this guy, and I had a whole pile of preconceived ideas, and I said, you know, did you have a bad relationship with your dad? And he said, nah, love my dad. Well, your mum? Nah, love my mum. Did you have any difficulty as a child or any traumatic experience? Nah, great childhood, amazing. Always felt loved, always felt accepted. And I started hearing people's stories, and now... Without exaggeration, I would have dozens of friends on Facebook that would identify as, as gay or lesbian and, and kids from, from youth, um, fellow youth leaders. One of my old pastors growing up is now self-identifying as a gay man and I'm in touch with all these guys and it's just, it's really important to not see people as an issue. Issues to be won in the argument, political discussion, these are people to be loved. 
and to listen to their stories. I think that's the first thing. And, and one of the things as Christians, you will never win an argument by getting the politics right. You have to make sure you win people with the love of God. That you look at people in the eye and you let them know that even if you have differences of opinion, I love you and I fundamentally disagree with you and I simultaneously love you at the same time. If you cannot get that right, keep your mouth shut. Secondly, observation. I believe the Bible does have clear answers as to whether homosexual relationships are um, approved or not in the, in the Bible. Some people say, well, in the Bible days, they didn't really understand what it was to have same-sex relationships like we understood today. It was all about um, abusive relationships or prostitution, but the research just doesn't test that out. And um, if you do a study of Romans chapter 1, you'll see that really what Paul is describing is it, it covers all sorts of same-sex um, intimate relationships. Even some uh, liberal scholars like William Loder, a guy out of Western Australia, Uniting Church guy who believes and endorses same-sex relationships, he just says you can't make the argument from the Bible. He just believes that the Bible is wrong. Good luck to him. But that's his view. He says you can't make that argument that the Bible approves of same-sex relationships. You can't make it. And um, the best book on this is a, a book uh, by a guy called Robert Gagnon. He's got a blog on this. Um, he's probably the world-leading expert on the, the New Testament teachings of, of sexual ethics. The third obstacle, the third um, observation I want to make is that um, homosexuality is not like the issues of slavery or women in the Bible. Often people say, in the same way that the Bible is anti-slaves and anti-women, it's also anti-homosexual and we need to just modernize and move on from these perspectives. First of all, the Bible is not, Bible's not, anti, is, is not well, pro-slavery. The whole theme of the Old Testament is God liberating his people out of slavery. There's a whole book of the Bible called Philemon about Paul saying, this guy was a slave, but now he's free and don't make him a slave anymore. And the whole world of slavery back then is very, was very different. It was not the kind of the, the race-based slavery that we see in, um, in you know, relatively modern day United States. And so while the Bible accommodates for a world where slavery is a reality, the whole thrust of the scriptures is freedom to the captives. Treating people with dignity in the image of God. And right throughout history, whether it be in Europe, whether it be in the United States, there have always, you, you can repeat that word, always been Christian voices arguing from the Bible against slavery. Even when Christian hypocrites were misreading the Bible with their own cultural lenses. And same with issues of women. There have always been women in leadership. There have always been women in ministry. And there's always been different voices on that. And there's plenty of scriptures so we can at least sometimes agree to disagree that some Christians will have different perspectives on the role of women in leadership in the church, even though I think it's, I'm pretty confident about it. There are some Christians that have, our, you know, our Catholic brothers and sisters would say, well, no, only priests can, priests can be male. Well, we just agree to disagree on that issue. But it doesn't mean that it's, it's a sub-Christian view. And the final observation is that, actually, I'm going to leave that because I'm running out of time. How does that sound? I'm going to get my preach on now. Now, uh, John chapter 4. So what's the good news that's going to be on your lips? I'm thinking about people outside the walls of this church, maybe some people within the walls of this church, and you feel like you're other. You feel like there's people that they would not even want to come within a Christian community. They would not even want to talk to you about Jesus because of the perceptions that we've been talking about. Well, I believe there's good news for you. From John chapter 4, the first point I want to make is this. Jesus is better than what you're looking for. Can everyone say that with me? Jesus is better than what you're looking for. Um, in John chapter 4, there was a Samaritan woman, and, he, and she came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a, a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where will you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well with the sons and flocks that drank from it? And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will be a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Let me tell you that Jesus has better answers than the deepest cravings of your heart. 
The things that you're striving for, the things that you're yearning for, the things that people in your life are running after, the pleasures of the heart, the pleasures of the flesh, the pleasures of the mind, the desires for the future, the goals, the dreams, the aspirations, all of those things are like the water that you keep on drinking, you keep on drinking. But I've looked out there, you've looked out there, and it doesn't matter how much water you drink, after a couple of days you get thirsty again. Can I hear an amen? Because you get thirsty, because it doesn't satisfy the deepest craving, the deepest need of the human heart. And Jesus comes along and he says to this woman at the well, I have something better than what you're looking for. It's not water. It's not H2O. It's living water. And get this, it's not going to dry up. It's going to be a perpetual spring of living water and it's going to go on and on and on and you'll never be thirsty again. You see, Jesus is better than what you're looking for. I believe for the heterosexual community, for the homosexual community, for the asexual community, for every community in the history of the world, Jesus has good news for you. Jesus says, I have come to give you life. Jesus says, I have come to set the captive free. Jesus is better than what you're looking for. Imagine if every person that you met, you saw them not as a problem, not as someone that you disagree with, not as someone that's a political opponent or an ideological opponent, but as someone that Jesus wants to bless, Jesus wants to love, and someone that's a spiritual seeker. You see, this woman was a spiritual seeker. Everyone else saw her as a water seeker, but she was a spiritual seeker, and Jesus met her need. Jesus is better than what you're looking for. Number two, Our belief can block us from a blessing. Have you ever been blocked from a blessing in your life because of a belief that you had? The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty. Oh, good, she's got it. (laughs) No, she hasn't. And have to keep coming here to draw water. So what does she actually think? Does she think it's like a genie bucket? And he's going to fill it up with this living water and it's just going to be like this self-filling H2O? She's like, oh, that'd be great. Can I have some of this living water? Because I just really am over this whole walking to the well thing. It's really tiring. She's standing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. She's standing before Messiah. And she asks him for water. Imagine if the people in your life that are crying out for purpose, crying out for identity, because you see this whole area of sexuality, it's an absolute myth that it's all about sex, because it's not all about sex, it's about identity. People trying to establish identity, people trying to establish a place in the world, people trying to establish meaning and purpose and pleasure. And you stand before Jesus and you can ask him for anything and you ask him for water. Because that woman didn't recognize who she was before. She asked him for water. And her belief of who Jesus was and what she needed was blocking her from the blessing that was right in front of her. She could have asked him for anything, but she didn't know. Her belief had blocked her from the blessing. Number three, Jesus sees the story behind our sin. Praise God. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to say, I did this because of that. The root cause of that sin is this pain. Jesus sees your pain. Jesus sees the perspective of your sin. Jesus sees the root cause of the struggles in your life. He sees it. He doesn't say, well, every aspect of your sin and your brokenness is good. He doesn't elevate it and glorify it. But he says, I see it. I understand it. And he says, I can bring healing and life to that pain and that sin. And so when he sees the woman caught in adultery, he sees her sin, but he does not expose it. He embraces her and he exposes her persecutors. When he sees Zacchaeus up the tree, this thief and this liar, he doesn't expose him up the tree. He embraces him down. You see, Jesus sees the story behind our sin. It says in verse 16 that Jesus said to this woman, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Throughout world history, well, actually not world history, throughout modern church history, this passage has been interpreted about being about a promiscuous woman. That's not what was the early church fathers never understood it that way. This was not a story about a promiscuous woman. This is about a woman who is a spiritual seeker. A Sumerian, someone that is other than, and I cannot think of a more other than community to the Christian community than a community out there that thinks that 90%, that 90% think that Christians are anti-homosexual. Not just the issue, but anti the people. The 
this Sumerian woman. Jesus didn't see her as promiscuous. He saw her as broken and hurting and in pain. Five marriages. Scholars argue that probably likely she might have been divorced once, but no man in that culture would have married a woman that had been divorced four times, three or four times. Just that didn't happen. There's no record of it in antiquity. And so it's likely that she might have been divorced once, but it's likely that she probably was widowed a number of times. Her husband died. Can you imagine the pain in her life? Can you imagine what it would have been like for her being alone and then living with a man that's not her husband in that society? And Jesus looks at her and he sees her pain. He sees her story behind the current state that she's in. Jesus sees the story behind our sin because, and he knows more than anyone that our sin does not define us. Jesus, number four, Jesus moves the conversation from geography to doxology. Hallelujah. You see, uh, yeah, doxology, dox, it, doxa is the Greek word for glory. I love that word. I just wanted to put doxology in there because I just thought it's cool. Um, Jesus moves the conversation from doxology, from geography to doxology. You see this woman, she wanted to talk about geography. Verse 20, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus probably said, is this all you got? You want to talk about mountains, what mountains we worship on? Jesus said to a woman, believe the hour is coming where you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Verse 24, jump down, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You see, Jesus paints a picture of what true worship is all about. See, this woman, she's trying to argue geography. She's trying to argue the issue. She's trying to argue about what divides her from Jesus. Jesus, you're a Jew. I'm a, Samarit- uh, I'm a Samaritan. Let's talk about how we're different. Let's talk about our different beliefs. Let's talk about our different ideologies. Let's talk about our different philosophies. Let's talk about our different view on sexuality. And we argue and we argue and we argue and we talk about what our divides are and Jesus changes the subject. He said, there's an opportunity. There's a time coming where true worshippers, doesn't matter whether you're Samaritan, whether you're Jewish, doesn't matter whether you're Gentile, where all people will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because of what he's about to do. He changes the conversation. You see, I believe people need to be invited to worship God, not to win arguments. Because um, I was remember a friend of mine at my work, my, my old job, he used to be um, a leader in his church and he, he had, really walked away from Jesus and um, wasn't following Jesus anymore. And he was, he was living a really dangerous life at, the, at that time as like same-sex relationships. Thankfully now he's, he's really settled down. But at the time I was really worried about him. He's living a really promiscuous life. And, um, and I remember one day I was talking to him and he used to try to shock me with all the stories he'd tell me. Because I was the good little church boy. <laughs> and he'd tell me these stories. And he knew I was a Christian. And every now and again, we'd, we'd talk about the Bible. And we were talking about the Psalms. And then we started talking about worship songs. And then in the middle of our work, we're meant to be working. We're kind of slacking off from work. And he just started crying. Tears coming down his eyes. And he said, he, he's a Kiwi. So he said, Timmy. He used to call me Timmy. He said, Timmy, I just miss worship so much. And my heart broke. And I thought, you know... <laughs> That's what I feel like Jesus is doing here. He's saying to her, let's not talk about geography. Let's not talk about what mountain to worship on. I want you to recognize that you can worship the Father in spirit and in truth, no matter what mountain you're on. Number five, Jesus reshapes the purpose, priorities, and passions of your life. Is that true of you? Has he done it for you? He's done it for me. Verse 28, then the woman left a water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and um, were on their way to him. You see, this woman, she came for water, but she left her jolly bucket. She probably got back and all the people were thirsty and they needed the water. And she left her bucket because everything that she once considered a gain, she then considered irrelevant. Everything that she was about, her purpose, her priority, her passion for that day was derailed by an encounter with Jesus. And I think Jesus does that in my life. You see, if I focus on the problem, if I focus on what divides me from Jesus and I don't focus on His Word and His presence and His love in my life, I'll keep focused on that bucket. But when I focus on His Word, His life, His presence and His love for me, I forget the bucket that I walk in with. Jesus reshapes our purpose, priorities and passions. Verse number six, 
Jesus really sees us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Isn't that good? Isn't it good that He sees you? He doesn't, pro- he doesn't project. He, he doesn't see you as your Instagram filters project. He doesn't see you as you are at your best or as you are at your worst. He just sees you. She says this. It says this, many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of this woman's testimony. He told me everything I'd ever done. Not that he opened up the scriptures to me. Not that he performed signs and wonders. But he looked into my soul and he showed me who I was. He showed me everything I'd ever done. Imagine that. Imagine someone looking into your soul like the ultimate prophet and showing you everything you'd ever done. And, 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 and they look at you not with judgment, not with shame, not with disapproval, but with love. Imagine what that would do with you. Imagine what that would do with your sense of wanting to be around God. Number seven, Jesus is captivating to the captives. Oh, I believe that with all my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength, that Jesus is captivating. I used to mock songs that used to sing, you know, like the Jesus is my boyfriend kind of songs. You know, I'm falling in love with you, Jesus. But you know, the older I get, the more in love I get with Jesus. I'm actually starting to realize that I'm falling more in love with Jesus. And I don't mean that in a creepy way. I just mean that I don't just admire Him. I love Him. I love Him. And the more I get to know Him, the more I love Him. Jesus is captivating to the captives. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to Him, they asked Him to stay with them, and He stayed there two days. And many more believed because of His Word. I believe that what God's doing across the world, that there are many, we see it in the Middle East with the rise of ISIS. There is an unprecedented move of God in the Middle East and in Northern Africa amongst Muslim communities that have been closed to the gospel for generations and generations. There is an unprecedented move of God. Signs, wonders, visions, church planting going on right now. It is amazing. People are being captivated by Jesus. And the thing about Jesus is that when you encounter Him, you say, can you stay for a couple of days, Jesus? You see, these Samaritans, these other people, when they encountered Jesus, they said, we want more. We want more of you, Jesus. Jesus is captivating to the captives. Don't worry about winning theological or intellectual or political arguments. Present Jesus. He is wonderful. He's good news for all people. He has captivated your heart. He has set your, you free. If you're a captive, He set me free. And number eight, Jesus' presence is the game changer. I always pay out young people for overusing this word game changer. That sermon was a game changer. That message was a game changer. That song is a game changer. Well, let me tell you that Jesus' presence is the game changer. Verse 42, they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that I believe, for we've heard for ourselves, for we know that this is truly the Saviour of the world. You see, they encountered Jesus and they were trying to check out, they were trying to discern, is this guy a prophet? Is this guy the Messiah? But after spending time in His presence, everything that they once considered truth was turned on its head and they said, this Jesus is not just the Messiah, He's not just a prophet, He is the Saviour of the world. Don't tell me what God can't do by revealing His presence, His love and His power, even in the most hard-hearted person, broken person, lost person, lonely person. That's my story. I wonder if it's yours. I wonder if you've had a revelation of how lost you are without Jesus. I wonder if you recognise the glory of the gospel for all people. I want us to look to the screens as we watch this amazing testimony of God's love breaking into someone's heart. 